Sorry to keep you waiting. My printer jammed at home. It's hard to get a good help these days. Huh? You ready? I will veto and return to the speaker, Chapter 72, House File 844, a bill related to education finance, as soon as I receive it uh, later today. The bill's additional investment of $400 million for E-12 education is insufficient given the state's large surplus. It's astonishing that with a $1.9 billion projected surplus and still more than $1 billion left on the bottom line for future tax cuts, there would not be more invested in our schools this year. And it is incomprehensible that a state tax cuts for millionaires and property tax relief for large corporations are higher priorities for the House Republican Caucus than investing adequately in our students and young children. The mill, bill admits the following additional funding, which the Lieutenant Governor and I specified in our May 15th email to Speaker Doubt and Senator Bach, a copy of which I believe has been provided to you. The bill that was passed by the bodies yesterday provided no funding for eliminating the waiting list of, of 2,500 low-income children for Head Start, no funding for the north side of Shiva Zone and the St. Paul Promise neighborhood, no funding for the Bureau of I Indian Education Schools and only meager funding for American Indian students, no funding for special education, no funding for English learning programs, no funding for free breakfast for pre-kindergarten and first graders, no funding for regional centers, which help our most struggling schools to improve. Also unacceptable is the absence of any version of voluntary universal pre-kindergarten to help 47,000 four-year-olds, which has been my number one priority in this session. Despite our willingness to move from full day to half day pre-kindergarten, and despite our urging that we take a comprehensive approach to educating young children, the bill neglects the opportunity to make transformational changes for our four-year-olds. Throughout this session, we have heard passionate rhetoric from Republican members about the urgent need to close the achievement gap. This bill belies that rhetoric and instead chooses to shortchange our youngest students for future tax cuts. Therefore, I will veto this bill when it reaches me. I also want to provide you with a little more background Last week from Monday morning until Friday afternoon, Lieutenant Governor Smith, our commissioners, staff, and I met almost continuously with House Speaker Doubt, Senate Majority Leader Bach, and there are other caucus leaders and staff to try to resolve our vast differences in dollars, programs, and policies among all of the remaining legislation. Throughout those discussions, we said repeatedly that our top priority was an adequate E-12 education bill. Most recent attention has been given to that section which funded voluntary pre-kindergarten for four-year-olds. However, our proposal also provided additional funding for the Minneapolis Northside and St. Paul Promise neighborhoods, the BIE Indian schools, special education, English learning programs, free breakfast for children in pre-K through first grade, and the elimination of Head Start's waiting list for 2,500 low-income children. At 4 p.m. last Friday, Speaker Doubt and Senator Bach met privately. They returned two hours later with their deal on all the remaining budget targets, which they presented to us to approve. Their $400 million target for E-12 education was far below our last $700 million proposal. Although they professed to leave the allocation of their $400 million to the E-12 Conference Committee, it doesn't take a math genius to see that much of our proposal would be left out. In fact, additional funding for all of the programs I just mentioned were eliminated from the final conference report. Friday evening, Lieutenant Governor and I emailed our counter proposal to the two leaders. In true compromise, we proposed a $550 million target, exactly the midpoint between their $400 million and our $700 million. We included, and once again insisted upon, $171 million for PK. That compromise was rejected, and the $400 million bill passed both bodies. Yesterday, in the session's last day, the Lieutenant Governor and I offered two more compromises to the House Republicans. 
First, we offered to drop our objections to all the other inadequacies in the E-12 education bill and sign the other remaining bills which had so far been posted in order to obviate the need for a special session. In return, we asked again for the addition of $171 million for pre-K. The House Republicans rejected that offer. Late last evening, we offered again to meet halfway in funding between the House Republicans' $400 million and our $700 million, and we offered to drop our insistence on pre-K in return for an increase in the school aid formula to 2% in both, both years of the biennium, which had been in our $700 million proposal, funding for the Minneapolis and St. Paul Promise School neighborhoods, Head Start, BIE schools, and an initial $55 million for the existing school readiness program. The House Republican Executive Committee would agree to only $100 million in additional funding. We again offered to meet them halfway at $125 million, again dropping our requirement for pre-K, and they again rejected that offer. Now, House Republicans have claimed that our pre-K proposal failed to muster the necessary legislative support. That's untrue. An overwhelming majority of House and Senate DFLers have indicated that they would have voted for its inclusion in the final bill. It is solely the House Republican Caucus opposing it unanimously who blocked its passage and denied 45,000 young children the chance for a better start to their educations. There were other vested interests who fought furiously behind the scenes to destroy our pre-K proposal. Remember that it would have been voluntary. No school or school district would have been required to offer pre-K. All parents who are happy with their child care services or other arrangements would be free not to participate. So what's the big fuss? Why deny other parents and their children that pre-K option? I'm told that some school superintendents and school boards who aren't ready or don't want to offer pre-K are afraid that the district's parents would opt to replace the district's children in other schools' pre-K programs and keep them there. And they would lose that per pupil aid funding for future years. Some child care providers don't want to lose their four-year-olds and the incomes they provide. Some real and self-proclaimed early childhood experts don't want to subject their biases to the real world test of parent choice to which they otherwise subscribe. So imagine all those adults who profess to care about kids, conspiring to deny thousands of them the chance to get early starts on their educations, to close their achievement gaps, and to offer their working parents safe, affordable, and advanced learning environments for their children. You're darn right the Lieutenant Governor and I are going to fight for them. Glad to respond to questions. Governor, you want to join me? Yes. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to discuss that with the Speaker of the Majority Leader. You know, in the past we've required signatures of all four caucus leaders that we would agree upon the agenda, and uh, it would be limited to that. And I would uh, plan to follow the same uh, practice this time. Do you wait for prior agreement on the contents of the bill before you follow the session? Yes. Is there anything else you'd allow to come up in the session? Well, I haven't had a chance to review any of the other bills. You know, I'm, I'm aware that the legacy bill was not passed uh, by the Senate, and the um, uh, bonding bill was not passed by the House. So, and I think both of those are essential. And uh, I haven't had a chance to review, uh, we haven't received, in fact, the other, uh, the other bills. In fact, we haven't received any of those bills, including E-12. So I have had a chance to review those. So I have until Friday midnight to sign them, and I'm going to spend most of the next couple of days, we are, to review them. Do you want to add anything to what I said so far about the? Well, I'll, we'll tell you okay. what the questions are. Thank you very much. Governor, your offer did not touch the other bills. Is that off the table now? Yes. Yes. Yep. So are you planning to veto any other bills? I don't know. I haven't seen them yet. We haven't received them, any of those bills yet that were passed yesterday. Uh, I've been rediscovered by a lot of people over the last uh, 24, 48 hours, and all of the legitimate concerns. I'm, I'm not going to make any further commitment until I have a chance to 
review the bills with my staff and uh, the commissioners and, and see. But, you know, I was the next 72 hours, so by Friday uh, at 11.59 p.m., and since you're all used to staying up to the midnight hour, uh, we'll have them done by then, but hopefully bef well, before, before that. But, uh, We were trying to s spare the taxpayers a special session. We were trying to, you know, with the additional funding, they already had $25 million in their bill for or $30, $30 million for the uh, school readiness. And another, this would put an additional $55 million. So it would have been $85 million for a, a, a beefed up school readiness program. And Commissioner Caselius could give you more details on, on that. Um, you know, I, I was going to do whatever I could to end the session on time. I didn't realize at that point uh, myself exactly how much unfinished business they had. So even without this, uh, you know, this addition, they, they were not able to finish on time. But I was willing to you know, go beyond halfway to meet them. Are you still willing to meet them in the middle? Or uh, will you continue to push for university? Uh, I haven't decided that yet, but you know, I, I, I don't call a special session yeah. until um, you know, my concerns are satisfied. And, and again, I'm willing to compromise again. Mm -hmm. But once again, the House Republic, I mean, at the very end there, we're talking about the difference between 150 and 125 after I've already come down 150 and asked them to go up 150. And they refuse to do that, so then they come to 100 and we're at 150, we offer to split that difference, meet them halfway again. And for that 25 million, and, and drop my number one priority, to end the session on time, spare, the legislature and, and most of all the people of Minnesota and the employees, the state employees working in the uncertainty and, and get, I believe, most of the beefed up uh, school readiness program, you know, most of what we were aiming for is pre-K, although it's not, not, uh, not the same. But I was willing to you know, give all that up in the spirit of compromise, agree to something I didn't agree with. And for $25 million, the House Republican Executive Committee would not agree to that. I mean, I, I, I'm just dumbfounded by that. Let, 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 let the Senate come, please. I just want to say that you know, what you saw yesterday was a willingness to, you know, the, the governor and I listened to what they said about what their concerns were around um, around preschool. So we said, okay, we sh apparently share this goal of all making sure that every single four-year-old in this state has the opportunity to have access to high-quality preschool. Let's talk about how we can do that. We're listening to you. And it's just so surprising to us that they, you know, as we move towards them, that they just kept stepping away. I think they have a lot to learn about how to compromise and get stuff done around here. Uh, Commissioner Mossman is looking at options, and of course, part of it depends on when the special session would be held. But um, I'd, I'd let him refer that. But they, they, you know, the folks are in the Capitol today, carrying on, on schedule to take, do, remove whatever they're removing now. Yeah, I'm serious. I mean, I was at an event last Saturday, the, the Hmong Lao Veterans Ceremony, and again, they had a tent, they had folding chairs in there. More than enough space to uh, to uh, you know include the uh, all the members and 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 the press. You won't have to stand out in the rain. We made sure of that, and you know people are interested. I mean you know there's space around it, and uh, you know they could vote the way that uh, good loudspeaker system, and they could vote the way I voted in the U.S. Senate by a roll call vote. So you know it's it's one it's one option. They can find something else uh, that's. Uh, equally inexpensive for the taxpayers and, you know, gets the job done. And again, with prior prior agreement on the bills, there's, you know, and there's as much debate, obviously, as they want to want to spend on it, but, you know, there's it's an up or down vote on what we've pr previously agreed to. So, it's, you know, I mean, people could vote yes or no. Governor, is it a bit disingenuous to only blame House Republicans when the Senate DFL also voted overwhelmingly in favor of the education bill that did pass? Well, the majority leader urged them strongly to vote to pass the bill. And he has said, and I, I believe him, he said that he would support the additional money for, for pre-K and for the E-12 bill, but he couldn't get the House Republicans to accept it. I was told yesterday that not a single House Republican would vote for uh, universal pre-K, even half day, even voluntary. I was told not a single House Republican. 
So, I mean, there was no way anything the Senate passed was going to get through. And Senator Bach wanted to end the session on time, as did Speaker Doubt. So they agreed on this $400 million and the, and the effort, a good faith effort by both of them to end the session on time. And, uh, but there's no doubt in my mind that, first of all, all the House Democrats voted against the final bill. They expressed their solidarity with me, and I appreciate that very much. And I have no doubt that a majority of the Senate Democrats would vote in favor of a bill that included uh, universal pre-K if, if, if the path were clear to get it passed. But if they knew there was going to be a special session anyway because you promised a veto, uh, shouldn't they have voted their convictions if they truly believed <coughs> You have to ask them that. that. Well, let me ask Commissioner Casillas to elaborate. First of all, it puts significantly more money into that program. And I'm not thrilled with this. I mean, I, th I said, you know, in my previous state of the state, I don't want to give more money for, uh, for K-12 education for the same old, same old. I want, I want innovation, which all day kindergarten certainly provides, in which this universal pre-K. Pre so I'm not here to defend the uh, school readiness program as a, a Really, even uh, a, a good substitute, and you know, there's a lot of institutional resistance by the school superintendents and the school boards to doing anything that requires them to do something they haven't been doing before. And it's very, very disappointing that people in that posi those positions, that these, as I've said before, some of these groups where you have childcare providers who want to keep their clients, and the money they bring, where or adults are putting their own special interests ahead of the best interests of, of children. It's very, very, been very, very uh, eye-opening and very disappointing for me in the, the session. But Commissioner, go ahead, please. Well, thank you, Governor. Um, I just want to say that we are always in support of universal pre-K for all four-year-olds. But the school readiness program is a community-based program, a wonderful little program in our schools uh, that offers uh, programming for targeted three and four-year-olds. And part of our our uh, conversation was to have universal for all four-year-olds but the targeted approach was for our poor and at-risk students in the current school readiness program our proposal would open that up for all four-year-olds and targeted at-risk three-year-olds it would also provide a licensed teacher which is a high quality uh, standard the current uh, school readiness program doesn't allow for or it allows for but it doesn't require any number of hours or days or um, that it's for the whole school year our proposal that's part of our school readiness proposal would be that it would be for at least three hours a day five days a week throughout the school year uh, that would provide for enough time for teachers to provide instruction so that kids are actually kindergarten ready the last thing that was different from the old school readiness program to the new school readiness program is that it was free of charge for parents I would like to Correct what I said just now. S some superintendents and some school boards have taken the positions I just described. Not all of them. Governor, and, and in fact, there's school districts, school boards throughout the state have already, on their own initiative, put uh, pre-K programs into place. Governor, does the House's uh, hundred million dollar offer cut into your argument that they're trying to preserve, you know, a billion dollars for tax cuts for the wealthy? Well, nine hundred million. And the strong probability we'll have more when the November forecast comes out, given that we're $347 million. Is that the right number? $360 million. $360 million. I can't keep up with him. $360 million of projected additional revenue coming in based on the first uh, first month. So we don't have you know something definitive we can use for budgeting and policy making until November and ultimately next year until the final. February forecast comes out, but it, all the signs are promising that our economic growth continues. So we're really talking. Speaker himself was quoted in, in paper a couple days ago saying uh, 1.3 billion left on the bottom line. So this would take it down to 1.2 billion, and I intend to push for more additional E12 uh, spending than than that 100 million or 150 million as part of my uh, what I'm going to push for. Not sure I'll get it, but we'll get no less. We'll get no less than 150 million dollars. Well, it's uh, after my general counsel refer to that, but um, 
There, this is the overall bill, the 16 billion, whatever it is. This Katie Sin. This bill is is all, all the bill. Uh, this is 16 whatever billion for E for E12. So all these all these uh, all these um, items here are in the are funded at base level. In the in the existing bill. Well, maybe given uh, the uh, state of affairs in the last couple of minutes of the legislative session, I should wait. But I'm, I'm they already passed the the bodies, both of them, and my staff was watching it very, very closely. So, if by some miracle, you know, such divine intervention, and this four hundred million dollar <laughs> bill comes down, uh, some, comes across my desk with something better, I'll be delighted to be proven wrong once again. Well, the first special session, uh, whenever you know we can agree on it, in terms of uh, you know the effects of after July 1st. I mean, Commissioner Francis is required uh, by statute to uh, issue layoff notices uh, by June 1st. So I strongly urge that we have this resolved before then. And there are other steps that will be, you know, very frightening to people who had to suffer through that before, and and totally unnecessary given we have a 1.9 billion dollar surplus and they. But again, that's why I agreed to concessions last night, and uh, along with the lieutenant governor, that went. I mean, I don't know what more we could have offered. We met him halfway on the difference between 400 million, 700 million, to 150 million. Uh, in a, I'm sorry, to 550 million, and then when they wouldn't agree to that, we we dropped another 25 million to meet him halfway again, and we gave up my number one priority. You know, universal pre-K, and they re and the House Republicans rejected both of those. I mean, it's really incomprehensible to me, but that's what they did. Given your concern about how these negotiations evolved late last week and the lack of transparency in the process, are you committing to a more open process going forward where some of these offers are made public sooner so the public can weigh in and figure out what's on the line? Well, we, we, we did practice the cone of silence in 2011. I mean, you know, as of last Monday morning, there were some very biting. Uh, statements being made in public about uh, my level of intelligence, among other things. <laughs> and that, that doesn't bother me as much as just the, the vituperative nature of what was being exchanged in the, in the press <coughs> was really in the way of, uh, we, had enough, we had enough that separated us in terms of policy and programs and dollars. And so I thought we, if we're gonna have any chance of reaching an agreement, we needed to have a cone of silence. I, you know, did I expect it was gonna take five days and still not get there. I mean, I guess I, I would have maybe handled it differently if um, we kept thinking, well, we, don't, we want to do it, give it two more hours, we're going to wrap up, up uh, other major measures, have more to say, and then we got stymied on something. So in, in hindsight, there should have been a couple of midpoints where we would go out there together and, and you know, give an update. But I do think that the, putting us together to try to work things out best serve the, the goal which you all shared of trying to end it. Well, because of the consequences of not reaching an agreement, you know, I, I went, uh, you know, I went through this in 2011. Uh, Senator Bach was president, but he wasn't in the majority. None of the House members were in in leadership positions during that time. So, I mean, I just, I, I hope and pray they learned the lessons from that experience. That was just, you know, catastrophic and unthinkable. Of course, I said that in 2011 before the end of the session. I thought that, that would impress itself on people and, and the, well, my version of the intransigence you've already ever heard, but I mean, to me it's just be, and that was in the face of a deficit. This is a face of a surplus. I, I mean, if they can't look ahead and see what kind of devastation they will bring upon the, their own constituents and the people of Minnesota and the school children if they just uh, aren't willing to compromise between, for, for $25 million, um, uh, but I will do everything I can within reason to, to uh, avoid that. If it's catastrophic and unthinkable to have a shutdown, couldn't you have signed this bill and hope for more next year? There's 400 additional dollars for E12 in the bill. I understand that you wanted more, but you could have avoided it, could you not? Well, 
I mean, I could have capitulated to everything they wanted and allow the House Republicans who are, you know, they have the majority in the, in the House. Democrats have the majority in the Senate. I'm governor. I mean, there's three prongs there, and there are two of them are DFL, and, and you know, up till last Friday afternoon, we were in large agreement. So, are we, so should the House Republicans have veto mm -hmm. power over the conclusion of the session? I don't think so. And uh, you know, there are other bills. I said there's the, the, the legacy bill and the, and the bonding bill. Both are uh, I consider essential. There wouldn't be a shutdown without them. But I mean, with the capital restoration, the funding for that is is, is in the bonding bill. So, uh, and I, again, I don't know what those other bills contain, but. I wouldn't be surprised if I didn't find some other reasons to call it back, and and to get it done right. You know, I mean, it's just uh, you know, there's a lot at stake in the short run, but there's even more at stake in over the next two years in the long run with some of these measures, and one of which is the future of 45,000 four-year-olds. Could tax relief be in play in a special session? Maybe an exchange for some. We'd have to. There had to be prior agreement. I've never been opposed to a tax bill, you know, and I understand the speaker. Uh, Representative Bach, <laughs> try again. Majority Leader Bach uh, wanted those two to be linked together. I understand his reasons for that. Uh, if they could work something out on transportation, I think then there'd be a possibility of doing a tax bill. But again, if we have prior agreement, and I guess that goes to the question that was raised before, do they have to agree on every single dollar and every single you know, provision in, in these bills if they come back with something New, no, but I'm not going to get, the other thing we'll put is a time limit on a special session, so it can't go on and on. Well, I can attest, I, first of all, the voters of Minnesota get to decide who represents them, and I, I don't ever quarrel with that judgment. I may disagree with it. But they decided they wanted a majority in the Republicans in the Minnesota House, and the Senate wasn't up, and they wanted a DFL governor. And, and so all the rest of us work with, within those parameters. Uh, do I think they're, personally think there are serious problems with, with the divided government, which, of which the ones we've gone through the last week, uh, you know, th that's, a, that's a judgment for the people of Minnesota to make. I get one vote in November 16, and I'm going to vote for unified government, because I think what we accomplished in 2013 and 14 with the DFL governor and DFL legislature was just overwhelmingly positive for the voters of Minnesota. But again, that's, I get one vote, and uh, I respect the small D democratic process that served this country and the state extraordinarily well. Well, I, I would want his signature on the final agreement before going. We recorded that previously, and, and for the special sessions we called for disaster. I mean, it, it prevents anybody from putting other extraneous material into the session and turning it all upside down. So, if he doesn't want to participate in the negotiations that lead up to it, still going to require his signature to for me to convene the special session. Uh, you know, the reason I went to the House. Uh, leadership yesterday, or we did, it was because he had said he it was uh, incumbent on them and and uh, us to reach this uh, further settlement, and so that's the way we approached it. Oh, it's the guarantee. As soon as I get these bills reviewed, decide on them, I've uh, canceled some other plans, and I'm and I'll be very. Both Lieutenant Governor and I are going to be. Very visible around Minnesota. I mean, they say there's no support for it, so let's find out. Governor, Governor you mentioned you saw how the House finished. Do you have enough concerns about the job bill with no debate? I'm not. I, I, well, uh, there may be there may be, uh, there may be other reasons. I'm not going to get involved in the, the legislative process. I, I watched the last minute and a half on YouTube. <laughs> uh, I've seen worse. <laughs> so, so you know, but I, you know, I, that, that's not going to be the re reason. If there are material deficiencies in that bill, then that's what would be the basis. Governor, uh, Republicans have said that looking back at the shutdown, a lot of people were declared essential employees and that funds would be a flow through the education department to the schools. They say people won't notice. But how do you or 
Well, I, we'd have to, I mean, I'd have to consult with council, as you recall. You know, last time we ended up with a, a district court uh, judge, you know, making determinations on what we proposed and others proposed. I mean, I, I, we haven't gotten to that point yet, and I do everything possible to see that we don't. And I, I don't I have to talk with council about what, what, who or what could, would be qualified as you know, um, uh, essential employees and whether the programs themselves continue or not. That's MMB and the, uh, the uh, I haven't looked at any of that. Governor, Valid are considerations, but Governor, I don't know. are you aware of another special session being called when the state has such a large surplus that didn't have to do with stadiums or some other issue on a budget special session? Has this happened before? I'm I, not in my memory, Lori but I. Says I yes. what? <laughs> Lori says yes. Oh. <laughs> Our historian. <laughs> Dick Cohen and Lori Stern have the definitive word on these uh, historical matters. Yeah. Governor, the session started with a lot of big talk about transportation. Did they end up coming to much? Can you comment on that? No, very, very disappointing. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I you know, largely agree with uh, Senator Bach, and I've said all along, uh, you know, a dedicated source of revenue for the additional funding for, for transportation that isn't gonna get swept away with, with the next, uh, you know, fiscal, or I should say economic downturn, which is what happened previously when they've had general fund money as a you know, support for that. So I, I agree with him, and but I'm very disappointed, yes. I just want to say it's just such a missed opportunity, and I know you guys have done a lot of research on this. You can look at states all over the country, including states that are led by Republicans who were making progress on this issue, and it just I just wish that people could get out of their kind of hunkered down position and really try to figure out how to solve this problem. Do you realize, uh, astonishingly, that there is in the E-12 uh, bill that all, all the Republican House members and I think most of not all of the Senate Demo Republican members, I guess a couple didn't, mm -hmm. there is a tax increase. Governor, some Republicans <laughs> have said that we fixed <laughs> the Oh, that was the end of that one. <laughs> 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 no, no, it's okay. <laughs> there was stunned silence. I would have taken it for an opening too. <laughs> Well, you want to look at a real power grab. They're using their power to deny 45,000 four-year-olds an opportunity to get a better start in their educations. And they're putting in place, you know, I, I'm all, again, I'm all for scholarships. I'm all for the, you know, school readiness, not by themselves and not with whatever they put in, 30 million apiece for each of them. I'm for all of the above. And for them to use their power to deny all those other kids who would be left out of scholarships and school readiness, deny them and a, you know, chance for a better start in life, I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, an inappropriate use of power. I mean, <laughs> I realize that, you know, they hate the public schools, some of them, the Republican legislators, and that they're loath to, you know, provide any additional money for public schools and for public school teachers because all the good programs I've seen around this state for pre-K and for all day kindergarten, all those good programs, you know, contradict what they say, which is the public schools do everything badly. And so, you know, but again, if they just, uh, and some of the groups, again, it's like, I can understand why the, the um, parent aware and the mini minds and so forth are for more money for their programs. I, I, I understand that. But when they're, when the, some of them, some of them are, are denigrating, uh, you know, the fact that all the other kids who are not gonna, for whom those programs will not have adequate capacity, uh, I, I just I leave them, I leave them there. Same thing with uh, you know those uh, school institutions who don't want to do this. You can blame it on the teachers, but they, they, they don't want to do it because they'd have to do it. And some of them literally take that kind of reactionary attitude, as we've seen with the teacher evaluations, where they want 100 million dollars to do more of something that they should have been doing 20 years ago. So there are a lot of cross currents underneath all this, uh, and it's very unfortunate that all of those self-interests get in the way of giving four-year-olds the best chance possible. No, I'm influenced by what I see in their classrooms. I'm influenced by whether or not I see kids going through, you know, really inspiring learning opportunities in, in those schools that have pre-K and, and kindergarten. You know, 
I, they want, I want qualified licensed teachers to be teaching that, and I think that requirement serves Minnesota very, very well. It's one of the reasons we have, you know, number one in ACT scores among our students in the last nine years. But, uh, you know, as uh, the um, commissioner said, and having lived through this herself, you know, the opportunity for parents, especially single parents, especially working parents, to take their kids to the place where they sent their older kids, the, the school that's in, often in the neighborhood and that they know is, is safe, reliable, there's gonna be a good a, a learning opportunity, often a great learning opportunity. I mean, these kid, four year olds aren't being put through, you know, rote memorization. They're having fun learning. They're having fun playing. They're having fun learning to socializing with, with other kids. And, and not just other poor kids, but other kids. All different backgrounds and experiences, which is a big part of the socialization experience of going to a school. And you know, I just think that's a terrible dodge on their part to say, well, because these are, you know, we'd be more more education Minnesota members, we're going to deny forty five thousand kids their best opportunity to start. I think that's shameful. I told her that, but I found what I think is a better approach. I'm going to require that. Uh, the OLA study is, uh, I'll accept, I've told her that, but the uh, privatization, which has been attempted since before, since when I became state auditor, and, and uh, virtually every year since, uh, I will not allow that as a precondition for convening the, the uh, special session. And I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to say, we're gonna have the legislative auditor, you know, doing an evaluation of, of the costs and other pros and cons of having, uh, private audit firms who have been making this case, as I said, for the last uh, 25 years. And, uh, but then to prejudge it and say that the, the, the counties and other uh, public entities can do it in August of next year, I mean, what's the point of the OLA evaluation? If they're mine, they're, it's the legislators, uh, those who have proposed this, mine's already made up. And I will point out, given that it's been said, well, you know, neither the House or the Senate passed some of these other features, neither the House or Senate Pass this, my knowledge even considered this aspect of it, and they just slipped it into the bill. So I share, I share a desire that it's really, it's, I strongly oppose privatizing those audits. So can I clarify, so you're, you're not necessarily going to veto the bill as it stands, but you're going to require that they backtrack on the language in another fashion as part of your agreement? I'm going to achieve the same result, in fact, a more permanent result, by having them remove that offending language from in order to convene the special sessions. I mean, if I vetoed the bill, you know, they could bring it up. I mean, I suppose if I, they take it out, they could bring it up the next time too, but it's, it gets the same result. There's a lot, lot, lot of other, uh, you know, like, a, like funding for all the agencies in that bill. Uh, I'm, you know, I mean, to veto the whole thing, and when I can find another way to accomplish, to keep my promise to Audra Otto, as it seems to me to make good common sense. So why do you do the same thing with other things you don't like, like silencers or whatever else you might not like? Will you have a list of things? I, do you I, have to change these? I, again, I, I gotta see the bills. I'm not gonna make any, I, I made that promise, I'll stand by that because she brought it up and raised that question. I'm not gonna make any decisions on any of these bills until, I, until we get the bills, until my staff has a chance to review them, until I have a chance to review them. So that's one option you could take. That's what you're saying? Well, is what option? Well, to say, well, I'll sign the bill, but we're gonna have a change well, that's a, that's a possibility. But you haven't seen the education bill yet. You've already vetoed it. Yep. Well, as uh, Winston Churchill said, I'd rather be right than consistent. <laughs> <laughs> you say no? Good job. I haven't decided. All the offers that the Lieutenant Governor and I made yesterday are off the table. And we'll have to look, take a look at it and see. I mean, you know, we went so far yesterday in, to, uh, to, to obviate the need for the special session, at least as far as I knew what was going on. Some of these other bills that didn't, didn't get finished up, I wasn't aware of at the time. But we went so far, beyond halfway. You know, they kept saying, well, are you going to meet us halfway? I went, we, we went beyond halfway to get this bill resolved and to avoid the need for a special session. And uh, so what else, what else is going to be in it now that this becomes a precondition for them to come back and, and avoid these further catastrophes? I, get, I haven't thought about it yet, frankly. Governor, yesterday uh, on the House floor debate, uh, Chairman Arun read this letter from the Laconia superintendent saying it would cost 
$17 million to add the classrooms that they need to accommodate the influx of these preschoolers. I know you've mentioned the frustration with the superintendents, but what have you, what communication has your administration had with the superintendents that are able to do this? Well, I haven't talked to the superintendent of Waconia. Uh, Again, nobody's required to do this. This is entirely voluntary. If they don't have the physical capacity, I respect that. You know, they said they didn't have the physical capacity for our all-day kindergarten, and 99.6, every school district except for one found the space. Now, if they don't have space now for, for the, uh, you know, additional space for the pre-K, I, I respect that. No one's required to do it. No school's required to do it. No school district's required to do it. No parents required to do it. So they can all opt out. It's just they want to prevent other schools, school districts, and parents from having the opportunity that they decide is best for their kids. And I, I just find that incredulous, that they, they, they're going to stay in the way because they're afraid, I'm told, because some of them are afraid, you know, their kids are going to, the parents and kids are going to go somewhere else for pre-K and say, hey, this is a good school program here, we'll just stay there. I mean, some of the, the just naked self-interest stuff, petty self-interest stuff that's involved in this is really sh shocking from people whose careers are supposed to be about taking care of kids and looking out for their best interests. And again, I'm not impugning all superintendents or all school, school uh, principals or all school boards or you know, anything about like that. I'm just saying I've been told that and I've seen it in evidence over the last uh, couple of months. I, I, again, I haven't seen the bill. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would hope that if with more time, the bonding and the legacy bills would pass. I'm not aware that there was, you know, there were, I shouldn't say there were you know, disagreements. There were because of the amount of money. I'm very disappointed the bonding bill is limited to $100 million. But, you know, something's better than nothing with that bill, so. If we could get uh, prior agreement on by the four caucus leaders, I certainly support that. But I, I can't. I have, we haven't begun those negotiations yet. Uh, very disappointed that it's not given that. Uh, again, there was bipartisan support in both the House and Senate for that bill. Yeah. No. My, my mother said, the "Actions speak louder than words." How do you move forward from here? Do you um, call leaders in? Do you wait? Assuming you're going to wait till after you see all the bills, or decide what you do, but do you want to call leaders in and start negotiations? Again? Well, I'll invite leaders in. I, you know, Senator Bach, from what I understand, said he's going fishing. So, you know, I, I get, then to, um, don't know at what point he wants to participate or send somebody else to participate, but, you know, I, I'll just certainly invite all the leaders because, again, all those signatures are going to be necessary as a precondition. Next week? Yeah. Or, you, know, you won't do anything about this on Tomorrow? negotiations this week? Uh, you know, again, <laughs> I'd like to get the bills. I'd like to have a chance to read the bills, and I will read the bills, and have review with my staff and commissioners, and then decide which ones I'm going to veto and which ones so we, they know and we know what the agenda is. Now, I expect that's going to take the end of the week, because these are a lot of, you know, and as you point out, there's something that's really bad in one bill, but there are things that are really good in it, so, you know, I have to weigh those in the balance. But by the end of Friday, I'll make those decisions, and that'll provide the basis for beginning negotiations next week. Do you believe in negotiating and then probably selling your uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. proposals off well, I you think negotiate while you're traveling? Yeah, darn right. I can negotiate just as well in, uh, <laughs> in Moorhead as I can in St. Paul. It's just the session has to be by the Constitution in St. Paul. It doesn't say I can't talk about it <laughs> around the state. Okay. Is that everybody? Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.